So I'll read a, a couple of the written questions, then I'll open it up to you guys uh, and girls uh, for questions directly of the faculty. You can ask questions about specific uh, lectures, specific points, uh, or more general points that uh, were not addressed. Okay, Dr. Block and Dr. Murphy. In Bitcoin, the Regression Theorem, and the Emergence of a New Medium Exchange by Laura Davidson and Walter Block in the QJAE, uh, you discuss uh, that Bitcoin violates the Regression Theorem. Can you explain your views? No. <laughs> it's, it's your article. She's a... <laughs> answer is no. The answer is no. No. <laughs> Gosh, that's nasty. Uh, I don't remember what I wrote. You want me to say something? Yes, I'll try to. Okay, should, should I do both Walter's position and then my rebuttal? Um, oh, okay, so I, I will try to keep it brief. That's a very technical question. Uh, so, you know, Walter has his article that you could go look, and then if you go to understandingbitcoin.us, I have a it's a website that um, this guy Silas Barr and I set up. It's like a, a primer on the economics of Bitcoin. So the issue for Austrian economists is, does it violate the regression theorem? Because certainly prima facie, it seems like, you know, it wasn't as if people were using Bitcoin first for consumption purposes and then later realized, oh, wait, this could be used as a medium of exchange once it became popular. Like Bitcoin from its inception was supposed to be they would say money, but we, you know, we as Austrian economists would first say medium of exchange. So that's the the problem. And Mises is quite emphatic in several places that it's inconceivable to imagine something that was eventually served as a medium of exchange that was not first used for regular purposes. Um, so my particular take on that, and then I'll let Walter, now that I think it's jogged his memory, he knows what we're talking about, uh, will, um, my take on that is to say, if Clearly, Bitcoin is, is already a medium of exchange, right? It's not money by any stretch, but people are accepting Bitcoins, giving away valuable goods and services, not with, because they want to directly consume the Bitcoin, but because they're going to trade it away again in the future. So that's a medium of exchange. So it is. So if you think that violates the regression theorem, well, then the regression theorem is wrong, all right? That, that's what I would say. So in other words, there's no way I think you can use Mises' work to say, Bitcoin's not really a medium of exchange, that I think just it, it is. And then you can either say, well, it doesn't violate the regression theorem. There's various ways to do that that I don't think we need to get into. I can talk to you later. Or you can say it does. But I, I, what I don't think works is to be real obstinate and say, no, it's impossible. I don't care what happens. I don't care if everyone on earth in the year 2100 uses Bitcoin to buy things. I still am going to say it's not money. It can't be. It's impossible. That That's what some people, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but some people come off like saying that and I think A, it's wrong and B, it just makes it look like Misesians on the internet are obnoxious. So Now I remember what's going on. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Menger said if it's, if it's a good, uh, that's the key and uh, the Bitcoin was a good, so I don't see how it violates the, uh, the regression theorem. The regression theorem says it has to come from some sort of good and Bitcoin was a good. Now, I just wanted to make a more general point. Uh, there's nothing wrong with criticizing Austrian economics. I've done it myself. I don't believe in everything. It's, we're not a cult. We are open for, for new ideas uh, if it's demonstrated that it's wrong. I just don't think that this one uh, is a good uh, overturn of Menger. Okay. Question number two. In my history class, we had to examine various explanations for why Europe, and in particular Britain, ended up with exponential growth while much of the rest of the world stagnated. We read Bernhardt's or Pomerantz, who said that it was coal and colonies. Emanuel Wallenstein said it was uh, uh, trade and the profit motive. And Robert Brenner said it was the rise of, of labor I'm um, not sure. What's the real answer, and what's wrong with these explanations? The real answer. Well, I'll, I'll make a few comments on that. Uh, well, what, one, 
One thing I think is important, and Ralph Rico would would uh, would say this if he was here, is that the the culture of ideas is important, and and a lot of classical uh, liberal ideas did come from Europe, the Scottish Enlightenment in particular, Adam Smith, John Locke, and so forth, and that that was an important reason why uh, uh, capitalism prospered there, and uh, much more so and earlier than elsewhere, and and also, uh, the, you know, if you look through history. Europe was a, a system of hundreds of city states, and so government was extremely decentralized. Uh, the, the whole trend over the centuries was more and more centralization, but for quite a long time, it was highly centralized. So, if you lived in uh, one particular city state that was oppressive in terms of taxation and and government controls, it was very easy to go next door or live somewhere else. So there was competition between governments, and that moderated the influence of governments in, in Europe. And uh, and I would reckon there's another book that wasn't mentioned in that question called How the West Grew Rich by uh, Nathan uh, uh, Ro- uh, Birdsell and Rothenberg, I think, are the two authors. And uh, and it talks about the, the same question, but uh, the one shortcoming of that book, uh, Ralph Rako has said, is it doesn't touch on the whole idea of ideas, uh, classical liberal ideas, and their importance to uh, uh, economic development in Europe. Another centralization versus decentralization. Michael Novak writes about why is uh, North America more uh, economically prosperous than South America, and he uh, bases on religion, which is similar to what Tom just said, uh, namely that. Protestantism was more um, uh, competitive, there were more Protestant groups, and Catholicism, uh, there was just one Catholic church, at least in the West. So again, we uh, get to the same motif, that more competition brings about a better product. I'd also add to the references given, um, you know, the book by E.L. Jones called The European Miracle. Um, I, it's, it's a book, I think, written in the 80s, but it's still valid, about the theme of, you know, how Europe was... Uh, highly fragmented politically. Um, on the on the question of growth, it's to add to Tom's points. I'd just add that it's probably because over many many centuries, in fact, that the institutions needed to, you know, for to to generate savings and to allocate those savings in meaningful ways, um, you know, developed. Um, and I think on this, um, there are many, uh, including uh, even Hayek's works. I think are relevant about the what it takes to evolve institutions over time. Uh, I'll just add, um, when I teach this, I mention also the the decentralized and somewhat competitive court system in Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, competitive court system in Britain that made it difficult for the king to grant a monopoly and have that reliably enforced in the courts because there were two or three different courts that you could take your case to if you wanted to dispute the monopoly. So um, that meant that people were not willing to pay the king as much of a kickback for the monopoly because then they weren't real sure if it would hold up in court, so it wasn't as valuable. Also, I think that the British were uh, willing to take in some of the entrepreneurial um, and, and business class from other countries when the state more or less kicked them out. For example, um, the French government um, uh, had uh, succumbed to lobbying from the old textile industry and the innovative, uh, largely Huguenot Protestant um, textile manufacturers that were producing this new all cotton cloth. Um, the, the, the French government um, uh, so objected to the Huguenots and, and oppressed them to the point where many of them left the country and Britain took them in. So uh, that allowed for growth relative to France. There was still a lot of statism, but not to the extent that you saw in some other countries nearby. You know, a good example of the, the power of ideas here, I mentioned the Scottish Enlightenment and Adam Smith, is uh, Ludwig Erhard, who was schooled in the Austrian school, who was the economic minister of Germany after World War II. It, uh, in, uh, the, when the Americans took over Germany at the end of World War II, uh, well, the Nazi economic controls were basically the same as the New Deal. It was very similar, you know, pervasive price controls. So the Americans said, well, we kind of like this Nazi economic system. We're going to keep it. And Earhart, on a Sunday, 
went on the radio in a, and broadcast over the whole country, no more price controls. And that was the start of the German economic miracle. That's all it took. It created markets. It literally created something out of nothing. There was nothing on the shelves anywhere. And within a few weeks, people were selling everything. And all, all he did was free up markets. And uh, the, the, the story goes, by the way, that when uh, the, the head of the American occupying forces uh, uh, and when you know barged into Ludwig Erhardt's office, and uh, and asked him what are you doing, and he he's, and the, the American guy said, uh, well, my economic advisors tell me this is a the wrong thing to do, and Erhardt said, well, uh, my economic advisors tell me the same thing, <laughs> but he but he but he did it anyway, and the, and it, that was the, the German economic miracle. I would just add one thing that Venezuela is the exact opposite. Uh, situation where they do have price controls of, of everything and they've got no toilet paper, no bananas, whatever it is they don't have. What do you expect to happen with Greece, the Euro, and the European community? Um, well, in my, if you have been in my lecture, I, I give you the different scenarios that you can can imagine what what might happen. The first one is that finally austerity measures are, and reforms are undertaken. Hopefully, this happens. Uh, the other option is that it breaks apart, and the third option is it breaks apart because or. Uh, Greece, for example, is not willing to do what it is supposed to do, or Germany is not willing to put up any any more with all the transfers. And the last option is, of course, we go forward to the centralization, uh, institutionalization of the transfers from north north to south, basically. Um, so, what will happen? What will happen is, of course, here the big question. Nobody knows. But these are the options. I. Uh, <laughs> And over the past years, you, ha you have seen developments in all these directions. Uh, with Greece, uh, they all almost got, got out. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, we have seen directions towards austerity. It worked in some countries quite well. Um, in Spain, for example, it worked well. In Ireland, even in Greece, last year there was economic growth, and this year it was... Uh, expected to have to grow again before the new government arose. But apparently the population of Greece was too socialistic, too, social, too, too socialist, too much accustomed to its welfare state to continue on this path. So uh, one estimation forecast would be maybe the population in some of these countries already too socialist to, to maintain the euro together uh, without, um, so the austerity option will not, um, will not be the, the final solution. Um, again, when I wrote the book, I thought we would go to the centralization. Um, then it looked for, for some time, I was more optimistic, maybe it works austerity. And uh, in the long run, and I, uh, in the long run, how, however, I don't think the euro will stay together for for two reasons. One is, well, we have then two options, no? Or we go to the austerity euro or balanced budget, uh, stability and growth pact, reforms, competitive uh, markets. Uh, restriction of the welfare state. I don't see that in the long run some populations, some voters will accept this in some countries. And especially I don't, I don't see that the Fran French political elite would accept such a, uh, such a European Union where they don't have con any control on the, uh, on the money supply to finance their expenditures. So in the long run, I don't think the, the French will, would put up with this. The other option, of course, is, is that we go to an inflationary redistributive transfer union. And I don't think either the Germans will put up with it in the long run. I mean, I think for many years to come, yes, they would. But at some point, they w will not anymore. So then it will break apart. 
I just wanted to add <clears throat> briefly that uh, in Greece, I think you can retire with a full pension at either 50 or 55, and you get two or three months holiday, and you know it's a very big welfare state. Uh, the issue uh, sometimes arises decentralization versus centralization, and usually the Austrians or the libertarians go on decentralization. Here I think there's an exception, because not that I favor the euro, but I favor a centralization well, one money, namely the gold uh, gold money. Whenever we've had a free market, it was gold. And I think the ideal system would be everyone should be on the gold standard, and that would be that. Uh, so I, I sort of favor the euro over the drachma and the euro, uh, but I don't favor the euro because of all the problems with that, which I don't think would be in the case of gold. Yeah, just on that point, let me make sure you guys understand the rhetorical jujitsu that the Keynesians are doing with this. The guys like Paul Krugman and stuff, they're referring to the euro as like a gold standard, okay? And which is just Orwellian. I mean, this, unlike the, you know, the mark or the franc or whatever, which historically at one point were tied to gold and then it was abandoned, the euro was a fiat currency designed by technocrats from the start. Certainly, w were any of you guys consulted with on the design of the euro? Yeah, I wasn't either. All right, so this was mainstream economists. It blew up in their face. And so yet they're now trying to say, yeah, see, this, you know, these people who believe in small government screwed up yet again when they had nothing to do with, with people like us. You know, this is not the failure of the gold standard. This is a technocratic fiat thing. The other thing, just the rhetoric of the commentary on what's going on with Greece. W what if I said to my bank, you know, yeah, I took out this mortgage to buy this house and I'm making these payments. It's kind of onerous. I think instead of paying back in dollars, I'm just going to uh, switch to Murphy's and just pay back, you know, in, Mur in Murphy's that I can print in my basement. I, I think I would find that more convenient. What you're objecting to that? What kind of a jerk are you? You, you see, that's that, that's kind of what's the commentary. You know, everyone's like, oh, it would be so easy for Greece if they could just go on their own currency and look it up. Well, yeah, it, it, once you run up huge debts, I mean, partly why they were able to borrow so much money at lower interest rates was because they were part of this responsible currency union. You know, more responsible than their history would suggest. And that's why they had those rules for admission because they didn't want some nation to be able to join borrow money and so on, and then have the whole thing be at risk and get you know need to be bailed out. So they had all those rules about balance, budgets, whatever, that the Greek uh, system was lying about. I think it was sort of like everyone knew they were lying, but they were shocked to discover how much they were lying, like around 2007. So, okay. Just one point on the Greek thing, touching a broader point. Um, I think it raises the question of how do you get institutions to evolve in certain places? Um, you know, a lot of the rhetoric about how the IMF and the EU and everyone's imposing certain you know ways of um, doing things in Greece. Uh, it's very reminiscent also of the kind of rhetoric which happens with developing countries, where you know the same thing happens. IMF gives a loan, um, and then you know some developing country doesn't pay it back, and then it's the same thing. They try to get them to uh, have reforms and uh, reduce their uh, expenditures, etc., in order to pay the loan back. And the same kind of rhetoric happens that outside forces are, you know, causing mayhem in the country, etc. When, of course, the fundamentals are all um, obviously out of whack. But the qu broader question, I think, as economists, is, you know, how do you get these um, institutions to evolve? Institutions of private property, of you know, uh, sane public finances, etc. I don't think uh, they maybe they can't be imposed from the outside. I wanted to offer a slight. Very slight disagreement, just rhetoric. Um, uh, I don't like the word developing countries. It's used by the politically correct types. They think that if they call them developing, that they will be developing. Uh, in actual point of fact, some of them are developing, some of them are in neutral, and some of them are, are retrogressing. So I think uh, a much better word would be underdeveloped or undeveloped instead of developing. They're all not developing. Some are like Ven our friend Venezuela is going the, the wrong way. They're not developing. They're undeveloping. Okay. Can you explain the British East India Company and how they became so, uh, so powerful? And would this kind of thing happen in an anarchist society? Okay. Well, the British East India Company is it's a very unique historical phenomenon because you had a company state. Um, and the way that happened was um, it, it, it's a very complicated um, evolution of how British, basically they went there as merchants. There were many, many other foreign merchants um, trading with different parts of India. The Dutch were there, the French were there, um, et cetera. Um, they got dragged into 
politics, local politics in India itself. So, you know, the, so for example, um, the East India Company, the big trading center happened to be, uh, one of the big trading centers happened to be Calcutta um, in Bengal, in the east of India. Um, and the governor, at that time, um, India was ruled by the, the Mughal dynasty. So there was a king in Delhi, um, but his hold was kind of loosening on the different parts of the country. And so his governor who was appointed, you know, who he had appointed in, um, in, in Bengal um, was kind of rebelling against him. The Brits got involved with that. Um, so so it's, a, it's, a, it's a very messy, very complicated kind of uh, evolution of merchants who gradually became uh, kind of like a company state. So basically they, they, were, they were given the right to, um, to, to tax, which is to, you know, collect land, um, land revenue, which was the main form of taxation um, in uh, the part, in all parts of India at that time. Um, and then, of course, then they were also good police, um, et cetera. And the, one of the first things they did, uh, which they tried to enforce but failed to enforce really, was to have a monopoly on Indian, you know, the, the, they had been granted a monopoly by the British crown. Um, but of course, that monopoly was always being violated by other private, uh, lots of so people who come to work in the East India Company, but then start trading by themselves and make a lot of money. Um, and lots of the reforms, in fact, of East India Company happened because of this sort of corrupt, uh, the sort of corruption which occurred due to the violations of the monopoly. But there's really nothing to do with anarchy here, uh, except in a, in a pejorative sense, in the sense of as far as the institutional conditions which were prevalent when the when East India Company came to power, um, they just got pulled into other politics. So it's not like you know they went somewhere and then they just set up a state from the start or anything like that. In, in the movie Gandhi, there was a, a scene where they, they were going to the ocean to uh, get salt out of the ocean, and, and the police were bopping them over the head. Uh, you've seen that movie, Gandhi? A very famous movie. Uh, this is a little later in the 19th century, I guess 1946 or 47, uh, whereas the East India Company was a century before. But it's the same idea of monopoly. If you try to make salt out of the ocean, it's the monopoly of somebody else, and you can be arrested for that. Okay, what good is secession if it invariably involves the seceding state claiming a territorial monopoly over citizens who do not desire to be under this government? Isn't this just a substitution of one illegitimate authority for another? Did we talk about that this week? Is that an Austrian economics topic? <laughs> I guess it was aimed at me. Uh, uh, that's, that's an example of, uh, I mean, Murray Rothbard used to hate questions like that because they, they, because they, they would come from libertarians who are purists, who would, uh, so if Murray would ever, Murray, no one is more pure than Murray, I guess, but, but, uh, but there are a lot of libertarians who think that their, their main obje objective in life is to prove that they're more pure than anyone else on earth as a libertarian. But Murray would uh, complain about that. I forget what he called these people. He has kind of a nasty name for him. Maybe Walter remembers. But if Murray would say something like, uh, uh, Andrew Jackson uh, uh, was a good guy to the extent that he defunded the Bank of the United States. You know, that's a move in the direction of freedom, getting rid of the Bank of the United States. But it didn't create a perfect libertarian utopia. So people would jump all over Murray. What do you mean, Andrew Jackson? He murdered Indians. He did this. You know, he did all these bad things. He beat his wife. You know, he used bad language. You know, you know he drank too much. You know, you know, didn't go to church. You know, all this sort of thing. Well, yeah. If uh, but but you know, the the whole history of classical liberalism though uh, tells us that decentralized government is much better than centralized government. And so, uh, and, and the whole idea of secession or nullification and, and federalism in general or decentralized government is to give people an escape route. And, uh, and, and if, if politicians know you can escape from them, uh, they'll change their behavior because they do all, you know, uh, elections are all about deciding who gets to plunder us. That's what an election is all about. It's an advance auction on stolen goods, as, as a wise man once said. But, uh, you know, the ones who are try to steal more from us, uh, if we have an escape route, that's a good thing. But uh, you're delusional if you think you're going to escape into utopia or heaven. 
Uh, you only escape into heaven, at least some of you anyway, when you die. I don't know how many, maybe none of, no one in this room maybe, but, uh, but, that, but that's it. So if you want to pretend that there is some sort of perfect solution to all the world's problems out there, have at it. But uh, that's not, I don't think that's the way Murray Rothbard thought, and that's not the way I think either. Yeah. Uh, the idea of secession, I think, is always reasonable because the opposite of secession is slavery. If you can't secede, uh, then you're a slave. You're, uh, the law of free association is violated, and the law of free association is a key element of libertarianism. Now, Tom is right. This is an Austrian conference. However, this is sort of a free-for-all the way I understand it. And, and a lot of times I'm in the hall answering questions, and many of them are on libertarianism, not Austrianism. So I guess that's okay. Uh, with regard to secession, I spend my summers in Canada, and I used to be uh, in Canada. I worked there at the Fraser Institute for a while. Now, take Quebec. Quebec is thinking of seceding. And if Quebec secedes, that's great, because we're moving toward the uh, libertarian ideal of 7 billion countries. One for everybody, we'll all be sovereign. That, that would be uh, libertarian anarchism. So if Quebec secedes, then Montreal, say, wants to secede from Quebec, and we say, fine. And if some neighborhood in Montreal wants to secede from Montreal, uh, fine also. And if some block wants to secede from Montreal and, and some house wants to secede from that block, in other words, where should, where should secession end with the individual? So any one secession will not be perfect, as Tom is saying. Uh, there are problems, but if you keep seceding uh, and everyone is a sovereign, that would be the ideal. Uh, on this, you could also consult uh, Mises wrote on um, a very had very interesting thoughts on how national self determination and secession, uh, secession were very important to the classical liberal tradition. Um, I, I think it's a nation state and economy a whole. I think the first part is devoted to addressing what is a nation, uh, how do you define a nation. Uh, what is this whole principle of uh, you know, self-determination of a group of people who consider themselves to be part of a nation and various complications surrounding that. Um, so you might find your answer there. And also uh, he has a section in omnipotent government, um, I believe, uh, later in the book. Um, so you, that might help you clarify some of these questions. Though these are thorny questions. Yeah, just really fast also on that. It's I grew up in upstate New York, so I'm you know Yankee and all this stuff. And I was... I came down here once and I used the, the phrase civil war and someone kind of raised their eyebrow and said, no, it's a war between the states. And I was asking, what, what's the difference? And so that, that's this issue of secession. I think it is important uh, just to clarify that. So it's, yes, of course, certainly in general, any secession in history is not going to be purely libertarian or, you know, the, the Confederate states, obviously slavery is bad. That's unlibertarian. There's all sorts of problems with that. No one is saying we love the Confederacy perfectly as it was. But the point is, if how could you not be for that principle? In other words, you how could anyone deny that people have the right to leave a situation they don't want? And so, just talking to regular Americans, it's very rhetorically effective if they rail against you know the, the Confederacy and so on. And say, oh, so you you were against on July Fourth? You you moaned that you know the the colonies seceded from Great Britain, right? Because there were slaves that you know. So there's that those kind of issues too, and it's again just very also it it this distinction between a civil war and secession I think is important because it's showing you could be for freedom without wanting there to be bloodshed that if, if more people just understood the principle yes if these people over there want to leave how, who are we to say that they need to stay in this this system so I think that it just shows that you know there's peaceful me mechanisms and resolutions to social conflict yeah Lithuania and Estonia are probably not uh perfect societies, but I, I bet the people there are sure are glad they seceded from the Soviet Union, as far as, far as that goes. But uh, I had a recent blog post on lewrockwell.com comparing Murray Rothbard to Abe Lincoln's ideas on secession. And Rothbard, in his article, The Nature of the State, uh, praised the uh, 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 some of the ideas of John C. Calhoun regarding nullification of unconstitutional federal laws. And then he goes on to say that if you advocate nullification, it follows that you must also advocate secession of a, of a say, of an entire state. And then, and then Murray said that, well, but Calhoun didn't go far enough. He should have said, well, then, then it's even better if you have a city secede from a state, and ultimately better yet for an individual to secede from this from everybody, as Walter just said. And I compared that to Abe Lincoln, who th who used the words invasion and bloodshed to describe what would happen to any state that seceded. And, and he said, because, well, if you let a state secede, then 
before you know it, a city could secede from a from a state, and then you know, and that would be anarchy and despotism, in his view. So these were just two diametrically opposed views of the whole idea of secession. Uh, Abe Lincoln saying, "I will kill you if you try it." And uh, Murray Rothbard, the great libertarian of the 20th century, saying this would be great if we all did this. So you couldn't find two more uh, polar extremes on that issue than that. <clears throat> Let me add a point from Spain on the po uh, on secession. Um, and practices can be complicated, for example, in the Basque country that want, m there's one party that wants to succeed. They are communists, so let's imagine that they succeed, uh, introduce their own government, communist government. Of course, this is bad for entrepreneurs who don't want to live in a communist country. Um, nevertheless, I, wo I would uh, I would be in favor even of this secession because for one, only then the Basque citizens if if will learn. Uh, will see the results of uh, there will be uh, institutional competition. They can see that this will not be a solution for the communism for for the problems. And also the, the other point is, of course, how can we? How could we justify to use the Spanish army to to uh, save this entrepreneur who says, "I'm a Basque entrepreneur. Please defend me against this." Communist secessionists. Well, we, 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 as libertarians, we cannot say it, it's justified to use coercion to use the Spanish army to to help this poor Basque uh, entrepreneur. This can only be done by voluntary means to defend uh, this poor guy. Okay, let's take some questions from the audience now. Yes, sir, right here. North also has slavery. Yeah. Yeah. A history lesson. I guess history is on the agenda here. Uh, well, slavery was brought to the United States by the British. By the British, and uh, it exists. The, you can go online, and there's a there's a website called Slavery in the North, and it existed in all the states. Uh, slaves uh, built the slave ships in New York Harbor, Boston Harbor, Providence, and Newport, Rhode Island. That was the epicenter of the the uh, slave ship building enterprise, and slaves were used to build the slave ships that sailed to West Africa. Uh, to kidnap slaves. And so, and then, but slavery uh, became uneconomical because of the short growing season in the, in the North and the high, and the expenses of feeding, clothing, and housing slaves. And so when they ended slavery in the Northern states, uh, the way they went about it was, uh, gradu they called it gradual emancipation. New York, for example, in the 1790s, you know, long, you know, very early on, they passed a law no, it wasn't 79, I think it was 1827, actually. I think that was the year. They said the children of existing slaves would be free upon reaching a certain age. I think the age was 25. So if you started eight, in the 1820s, that meant by the time you get to the mid-1850s, that baby born would be free, <clears throat> you, know, uh, you know, once he becomes age 25. So when the baby became, the child grew up and became 24, he would be sold into slavery in the West Indies or Brazil or so, someplace like that. So they ended slavery. They phased it out over several decades, but they did not free very many slaves in the northern states. And there were still slaves in New York City uh, as late as 1853, you know, just uh, eight years before the American Civil War. And, and of course, slavery existed under the United States flag from the late 1770s until 1866. So it was protected by the U.S. Constitution for for all those years uh, compared to, uh, it was protected under the Confederate Constitution for four years. So all those people who are tearing down the Confederate flags, they really ought to be taking down the U.S. flag because slavery existed for many, you know, orders of magnitude worse than, uh, than, the, than the Confederate flag. Some people at the Cato Institute think that if you favor secession, you favor slavery. But the first state to want to secede was in 1825, I think uh, historians can correct me. And it was abolitionists who wanted to secede from the U.S. on the ground that the U.S. had slavery and they were against slavery. Now, there is such a thing as civil war. 
the Spanish Civil War of 35 and the Russian Civil War of 1917 were civil wars in the sense that each side wanted to run the whole country, but the South didn't want to run the North. It was truly a war of secession or a war to prevent secession or a war of Northern aggression or what have you. Question over here. Uh, so on the topic of the future of liberty within our lifetime, are you guys optimistic or pessimistic about that possibility within the lifetime of the general attendee here? Well, I, I think Judge Napolitano hit the nail on the head when he said you guys are either going to die in a public square or... Uh, so I, I think the, the central banks around the world have really set economies up for bad times ahead. I, I don't see how that's going to be good for liberty in the sense when people are scared and they're uncertain economically, they turn to the state to, to help them. And so medium term, I'm not particularly optimistic, but maybe these guys will give you a, a reason for optimism. When Palatona said they're probably going to die in a pub, he said public square? <laughs> he said pub. <laughs> Some of us. Oh, well, you know, you know, that talk, the, our mystery speaker from last night, I mean, he, he seemed op awfully optimistic, didn't he, that the technology was going to start crushing a lot of the institutions uh, of the state that are out there. And, you know, there are a lot of us that there were, you know, we all knew that socialism never worked as an economic system, but the Soviet Union confiscated so, so many resources from so many other peoples that it was able to eat up all those resources for several generations until it finally imploded through peaceful secession. And uh, so if it can happen there, it can happen here. Uh, although Americans, the, the Russians, are the, they did not have the advantage of having made a god out of uh, their version of Abraham Lincoln. And so the, one, one, one of the reasons why you, most Americans don't even know the word secession, they think it's succession. Yeah, they, I get emails all the time about the succession, S-U-C-C. -C. They, they can't even spell the word, let alone understand anything about their own history. But they, but they do, uh, but they have brain, you know, brainwashed into their heads from elementary school on that this is the most evil thing in the history of the planet is is the breakup of of the central government, which was attempted by those those uh, the most evil people in the history of the world, of course, the uh, the Southerners in in, in the eighteen sixties, and so. And so uh, they don't have that disadvantage. Eric Foner, the, uh, the Marxist historian at, at uh, Columbia, wrote an article in the Nation magazine, I think, I think it was October 1991. There's a footnote to the exact reference in my book, Lincoln Unmasked, where he, he opposed the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, and he says, he says, it's too bad they don't have an Abe Lincoln. This Gorbachev guy is a softy. You know, and, uh, and he thought it was... And so, and so we, so we have that kind of person who is uh, the endowed shareholder at Columbia University educating young Americans uh, on this sort of thing. And so the breakup of the state is seen as an impossibility by so many people, but history says otherwise. And, uh, and we do our best to encourage people to think otherwise as well. Uh, the reason the Soviet Union was able to last from 1917 to 1991, I guess it was, or 89, uh, is they had Western prices. Uh, they, they had the Sears Roebuck catalog. They could look at what was happening in the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Uh, during the first five years, the 1917-1922, uh, they had pure socialism, and they themselves went to the NEP, the New Economic Plan in 22, because they acknowledged that from 1917 to 1921, they weren't using Western prices, and, and the thing was a total mess. So even they went uh, to... Uh, uh, to a, a quasi-capitalism where you had prices. And, and so Mises' idea in socialism only applies if they don't use Western prices or if the whole world goes on to uh, socialism and then there are no uh, uh, prices, market prices. Uh, with regard to the question, I'm very ambivalent. On the one hand, the case for optimism, when, optimism is when I first met Murray Rothbard in 1966, I asked him, well, how many Austro-Libertarians are there in the world? And he said, oh, 25 or so. And you know, <laughs> 25, we've come a long way, baby. Uh, you know, the, uh, the gays used to say, we are everywhere. Well, we are everywhere. We're, we're all over the place. And thanks to Ayn Rand and um, uh, Ron Paul, uh, there are millions of people who are libertarians. On the other hand, 
I'm a believer in sociobiology. And sociobiology, uh, what I get from that is that we're hardwired for socialism, which is why Ron Paul gets, you know, 1% of the vote and why people trash Ron Paul and why uh, the Pope says, what is it, capitalism is the dung heap of... Uh, Dung of the devil or something like that. Uh, so I, I think there's a, a lot of us are hardwired. We people are mutants. Uh, we are open to the possibility of freedom and, and uh, the invisible hand. Whereas most people, uh, even if they're very bright, uh, I have a daughter who's got a PhD in neuroscience, total pinko, and what can you do? Uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of people are just unable to, to grasp this uh, simple simplicity thing of, of, of the invisible hand. And I think it's because we're hardwired for that. So uh, this gives me the case for pessimism. So here I am sort of ambivalent on the one hand, we've made great strides. And on the other hand, I think we're bucking up against biology, which is tough to buck up against. Murray Rothbard used to say often that he was, in the long run, he was very optimistic. In the short run, he was always pessimistic. And I think I, I've taken that on myself. And it it gives you the proper view of what's going on in the world. Bad things are going on in the world right now in the short run. The short run prospects are not good. But I think the long run case for optimism is very bright. Just to build on Mark's point um, on this question, uh, you can make that case also because if you compare you know, this period to, let's say, the period of the 30s, uh, you know, very similar things. You could, you could make that comparison. Very similar things happened. You had a big worldwide recession. Um, similar steps uh, have been taken, or probably more unorthodox steps this time. Uh, but the big difference is that um, you know the West is not alone anymore. Uh, the, the the fact that India and China have now started moving towards the market, um, and other there are other countries uh, you know in Asia who are far more receptive to markets than they were in the 1930s when they were all moving to socialism. Completely changes the ball game simply because you have more institutional competition. Um, you know, capital can move. Uh, much quick, much more quickly, um, you know, away from any country which increases controls in the long run. So in the short run, I agree with Bob actually that because of all the tsunami of money that's you know been unleashed, um, that there are stock market bubbles in literally every part of the world, um, and that in the short run we're going to have trouble. But I think in the long run, the the whole um, picture, the whole you know environment of ideas is is different. It's almost like there is no dominant ideology right now as compared to what it was in the 30s. I mean, I think that's a good thing. Uh, GP nailed it. I was just going to add that if you look at the index of economic freedom, you see that, for example, the United States has dropped over the years from a position of maybe number three or four down to about number 12 or so. And that's partly, I think, because the United States has seen some policies moving us in the wrong direction. But I think also it's because the rest of the world has been moving, in, a lot of the rest of the world has been moving in the right direction. So it, the answer to the question really depends on where you are. Uh, North Korea, I predict, will do better economically in the next 50 years. Why? Well, it could hardly do worse. <laughs> so, uh, it, but generally, though, all kidding aside, it probably is, um, it is going to be better worldwide, even though in any one particular country you might see a, a move in the wrong direction. Okay, quick question right behind you. Um, you guys were talking a little bit about uh, religion and its involvement in uh, uh, economic growth and, and liberty. Uh, what do you think of Max uh, Weber's thesis? Is it right or wrong, or was he not nuanced enough? Or? Well, the Protestant, what, what's, what's thesis are you referring to? Oh, yeah, the Protestant, uh, or the, uh, the spirit of capitalism. Protestant ethic. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Uh, Mention that. Uh, just on the broad point of uh, the role of religion in, in development and growth, um, you definitely, I, I think it, it can play a strong role. Um, I'm, not, I'm not familiar enough. Uh, I know Weber's thesis uh, broadly, but I don't know enough about um, the, the different nuances to give you an answer on that. But um, if you think of um, you know, cultural, moral institutions in a utilitarian framework as means to uh, you know, ends um, that propagate and you know, promote the right institutions for growth, um, you would have to conclude, looking at most of the historical evidence, that religion has played a big role uh, in creating the, the institutional environment that's conducive um, for growth, not only in the West, but in other parts of the world as well. Um, so yes, religion, I think, is very intimately connected um, in, in providing, you could say, almost like a, a, you know, a, a foundation for the rest of the institutional structure above that. 
Yeah, just real quickly. I mean, disclaimer, I am Protestant, so presumably I'm biased, um, and I like work, uh, but, and I like ethics, so there you go. Um, I, I think there it be, you know, just purely secular analysis, you know, to explain why does there seem to be this correlation of, you know, economic growth in areas that are populated by the people who believe this stuff, these doctrines. I mean, part of it is, if you believe that there's this God who's just and has laws and so forth, the, the king cannot violate that stuff. So I mean, so there there is that notion there, and I also think even beyond just Protestants, but the church, you know, Catholic Church, whatever, I do think you do see strains of secular author political figures trying to make people not believe in the church anymore because they don't want there to be anything competing for their attention and their their you know power. This is my quick take. And I'm also Protestant, but I would point out that there are some exceptions that are quite notable, like, for example, northern Italy, um, uh, which was heavily Catholic, of course, but was economically quite successful. Uh, Scotland, um, not terribly uh, uh, high growth as a country, but, of course, very heavily Protestant. Uh, notably, some of the Scots who immigrated to the United States ended up being very successful economically, but there are enough of these of these exceptions that it, it starts to poke a number of significant holes in the Weber thesis. Um, that being said, I do think that the competition that Protestantism um, was characterized by, the, the theological competition it presented to the Roman Catholic Church, the, the uh, ripping into that uh, divine right of kings that you see in some Protestant um, philosophy, that that, I think, was very important to the breakdown of, of state power. Just one quick point to add to Tim. Um, a lot of the re historical rewriting of the Middle Ages, um, I think, now undermines some of Weber's thesis that the Middle Ages weren't the Dark Ages, and so you know, there wasn't this gap. Um, and that would imply that you know, uh, Catholicism and Catholic countries in the Middle Ages weren't complete basket cases either. So. Okay, let's take a break. Can you come back here or go upstairs? <laughs>